Dark Souls means a lot of different things to people, and everyone gets something slightly different out of the overall experience. People have the freedom and flexibility to enjoy the game in a variety of ways, but the common... Th Thank you for including that, Chopper. Whoops. ...thread that unites us all in all of these experiences together, it, beyond it being seemingly really hard and all of us dying more times than we can physically count, is the feeling of effort followed by reward, the risk and payoff, the fear of being trapped and being absolutely hopeless, and then the elation when you finally find safety, the feeling of accomplishment when you beat a boss that was holding you down, and the feeling of all of your hard work to get better genuinely paying off. What Dark Souls 1 manages to accomplish is nothing short of a miracle. The game is a work of art made real and tangible. With that said, it does have some real flaws and imperfections that cannot be ignored. In fact, I think Dark Souls 1 gets many things right, and the good far outweighs the bad. But some of its blemishes are quite glaring and obvious, and unfortunately do not age all that well. But art doesn't need to be perfect in order to be beautiful, and right. I think Dark Souls 1 is a beautifully flawed game as an entire experience. Whether Dark Souls 1 was your personal first exposure to the Soul series, or just, it was. you know, FromSoft games in general, I really think it's going to provide you with quite a unique experience, and that even holds up and is still true in modern day. While each Souls game is unique in their own little ways, I think Dark Souls 1 has a very specific type of unique that plays on your emotions and your risk-reward decision-making in a way that... Yo, did you just die to Moonlight Butterfly? <laughs> almost no other game is quite able to do in the exact same way. Even future iterations of Dark Souls games don't quite grasp that same level and emphasis of that fear reward back and forth that DS1 does so well, I'd argue. I would make the case that some of those would-be future titles are actually better suited for other types of gameplay challenges and obstacles to overcome that make those more enjoyable in their respective ways. But something DS1 undeniably does so well is its ability to instill tension and real fear of loss into your very soul to eventually have a heavenly payoff when you learn a boss or when you find a bonfire shortcut after being in the trenches for hours and hours the <laughs> the the slime trap lows are really low and the highs are quite high again every please don't show Gwendolyn when you say that the highs are really high Show Artorius, Manus, Ornstein, and Smo. Souls game is built on this, but DS1 keeps this in the foreground most apparently in my eyes. The relative scarcity of bonfires in DS1 is a prime example of this. Yes, it's also a key for how much a, a lot of the level design works, but it also serves the function of making it so that you treat your life as a much more precious commodity. I mean, you know, practically the thing that Dark Souls is known for is that how much you'll be dying a lot. And it's always punishing to die in a FromSoft game. But particularly in DS1, souls are your only means of progression and they are your lifeblood. Without them, you're nothing. I mean, there's entire areas of the game that have no bonfires at all, making you move a lot more carefully and with caution around each and every corner. This does have its drawbacks, though, which we'll talk about later. Like, even after defeating a boss, you know, typically in these more modern games, we're used to getting a bonfire location after said boss is dead. But that is not the case here. You're not guaranteed an immediate bonfire after beating a boss. And in some cases, I think it works. And in other cases, I think it's actually a detriment to the game. But the point is, in some sense, I can really appreciate the fact that your life really does matter in DS1 and that you treat everything with the utmost caution and although you will be parting with your life a lot it's not a kind of death that takes all the wind out of your sails and just makes you want to give up on the game entirely exactly you know what kinds of games i'm talking about where you've been playing for a while and you've got <laughs> except bed of chaos yeah except bed of chaos You've got all the stuff, but you die and you lose it on. You're just like, I'm just like done with it. You may even uninstall the game. Dying in Dark Souls is the exact opposite. You feel almost more motivated. The game picks you back up and says, dust yourself off, run that shit back, and do it better this time. And if you don't have any souls, if you're doing an area or trying to beat a boss, there's really no major punishment for dying. So if DS1 is your masochism simulator of choice, then you'll have plenty of opportunities to part with your life and run it back until you get where you need to be going. 
Dark Souls doesn't give you any free handouts, doesn't let up if the game's being too hard on you, which is why it feels personally satisfying to beat something, because it was entirely of your own skill and action, whereas, you know, many other action games in modern day have mechanics that can make it seem like you're doing a lot more than you really are. Okay. I don't know why this had to be the comparison, but okay. Nothing wrong with that inherently, and video games being accessible to all people, regardless of skill or prowess, deserve to have something to play. And Dark Souls ends up taking those accessibility options and baking them into the mechanics of the game itself. There's a lot to the core that made DS1 so incredibly refreshing to the palate, but I think its most unique feature by far is its interconnected level design. It's a linear game that manages to play so non-linear at the no, 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 no. It is not linear by any means necessary. If you start with the master key in Dark Souls 1, you can literally access almost every area in the first half of the game at the very beginning. Dark Souls 1 is an open world game and you can't change my mind. The same time, with the perfect amount of seemingly uncharted exploration, followed up by just like this like aha moment when you finally loop back to Firelink Shrine, or when you open a door to connect the entire other side of the map. On top of that, it's got some of the coolest secrets and hidden areas that can also be accessed and that make this experience something entirely unforgettable. Unfortunately, I have to say, one of the more obvious ways in which Dark Souls 1 clearly shows its age is in its combat and its bosses. Not to imply that they are bad, it's just that DS1's combat and boss design in the year of our lord 2023 feels incredibly dated, and beyond that, it's just a, a lot more of a rigid and, and clunky and stiff and, and not... It's a lot more uh, deliberate. You have to actually think about what you're doing before you do it, because every action that you take means that you can't take another action. It means that you have to... Uh, you have to give up, you have to open yourself to, up to vulnerability and getting punished uh, for a chance of getting a hit in on the boss. Not to mention the scuffed nature and polish, even that the remaster has still plagues the game to this day. And I have to say... <laughs> can I... Can I see that again? Even that the remaster has still plagued... Boom! The game to <laughs> Outside of the map this day and i have to say dark souls 1 bosses are great but they're not a flawless lineup or track record compared to something like dark souls 3 which basically doesn't miss at all when it comes to bosses That's ds1 not has a few examples of just like like seriously like what the f were you lads thinking also in my other reviews of souls games which <clears throat> um you can go uh, check out my other ones too i usually talk about every single boss in detail however dark souls 1 has a lot of bosses that i just don't have that much to say about there are a lot of throwaway bosses in Dark Souls 1. Capra Demon, Taurus Demon, Asylum Demon, Stray Demon, uh, Bed of Chaos, Centipede Demon, a lot of demons. Uh, Pinwheel. Uh, Sanctuary Guardian. Who am I forgetting? Uh, I think that's it. I think those are the ones that are the most throwawayable. Like, if you threw them out of the game, you, nobody would notice. About. A lot of them are pretty much carbon copies of each other with a few oh, minor Fire differences Sage, here duh. and there. So instead of breaking down every single boss in detail, for Dark Souls 1, I'm just going to highlight the ones that I think are important and stand out for either good or bad reasons. I'm going to have a dedicated section later in the video for bosses, and I'm going to be talking about most of them, but there will be a few that I probably just skip over. But I will be making sure that I also do cover DLC bosses, so don't worry there. But then there was fire. And with fire came disparity. 
Upon beginning a game of Dark Souls, it opens up like basically any other game, but its tutorial area is honestly so incredibly intelligent and deliberate in what it's teaching the player. You basically get the grip of the combat mechanics and find a resting place, only to then be immediately faced with one of the game's most unexpected and threatening enemies, in which you realize you just simply aren't equipped to deal with this thing. So event- No, no, you can beat the whole game with the broken straight sword hilt. No problem. I've seen it done. <laughs> you can be absolutely OP if you RTSR and you max level the weapon. <laughs> Eventually, you either die a couple times until you realize that you can find an escape route to further explore. You get hit. You do get rewarded, by the way, if you do kill the asylum demon with the straight sword, the broken straight sword hilt. Uh, you get rewarded with the demon's great hammer. Uh, if you beat a uh, asylum demon without having to go the whole way around. Hit with some unexpected traps and, and, you know, you find a real weapon. It even introduces the concept of secret areas when a wall breaks open and you learn the basics of shortcuts and keys to move about levels. And for all of that effort, you get rewarded by finding the drop on that same boss that, that felt impossible before. You get a really good vantage point and now can actually take it out with a real weapon and, you know, some better positioning. Once you beat it, you're feeling quite confident as you fly over to Firelink Shrine. Yes. The the tutorial zone for Dark Souls 1 is probably the best tutorial zone in gaming, period. It has the best tutorial of any game I've ever played. That is until you stumble into the catacombs and the skeletons who promptly put you back in your place and knock your ego back down to earth. <laughs> Once this area of the game denies you enough, you'll go out and explore some of the other alternative paths that you have access to. You'll eventually work your way through these initial areas, slowly but surely upgrading your character and leveling as you unlock and explore the world around you. And just when you think you've gotten pretty powerful and your confidence is high, you'll cross that one particular fog wall and be met with another challenge that puts you back down to earth. In terms of just like playable space and sheer square footage of, you know, areas in Dark Souls 1, it's honestly not that big of a game, and the world is fairly small compared to basically everything else that they've made. But I mentioned how Dark Souls 1 level design is so beautifully interwoven with itself, and how it gets away with having a more scarce amount of bonfires or otherwise checkpoints than other titles do. This smaller level design is not exactly a detriment, though. It manages to feel unbelievably expansive, despite not being a terribly large map, technically speaking. This gives DS1 its genius level design and progression path, not to mention probably saved huge time and money on not having to develop a bunch more areas and set pieces in the game. All of that on top of, it gets to have the added benefit where you have a lot of- I fucking love looking at those uh, rendered maps of DS1, looking at how the level connects to itself and cascades down into the other sections of the game. I fucking love looking at it. It's a master class in actual level design and how video games should be designing their games. Literal perfection. Of those oh sh moments and you know when you realize that you know the undead bird connects down to firelink seeing the new londo ruins connect to the valley of the drakes realizing that the tail end of blight town actually comes out the other side to the valley of the drakes and then back to firelink all of these moments don't come without real effort though you have to explore really carefully in the catacombs or in the sewers and painstakingly link every little shortcut and such it's always some real effort and fear followed by unless you start with the master key by a reward while i cannot honestly look you in the eye and tell you that dark souls 1 is my favorite fromsoft game ever its interconnectedness and really deliberate level design especially in the first half of the game are i would say dark souls 1 is number three on my list it's in my top five it's in my top three because it's elden ring dark souls 3 Dark Souls 1. Um, and then I would put uh, Sekiro and Dark Souls 2. Those are the ones that I've played. I've not played Demon Souls. I've not played Bloodborne.
are absolutely immaculate. The amount of thought and attention to detail as it relates to rewarding the player with a shortcut or a bonfire or just, you know, the way that you, you feel as if your actions matter is absolutely unmatched by anything else in the Soul series. Wow. And it's why XQC? It's what makes for some of the most heart pounding moments that are, you know, completely detached from the boss fights themselves. However, this level design does fall apart a lot in the late game of Dark Souls 1. The second half of Dark Souls 1, I'm going to spoil it for you, is the most dog shit of any game ever. The highs, as. As he said at the start of the video, the highs are excessively high, but the lows are at the fucking abysmal bottom of the barrel. <laughs> One, sadly. And the late game begins to feel a lot more strung along and half-baked compared to how dialed in and meticulous it was in about the first half or so. On the topic of progression, another huge weak point of DS1 has is actually that it hard locks you into committing to one kind of build period, that on top of the fact that some of the stats are just, just kind of strange. I'm... I, I'm DS1 has is actually what am I looking at you into committing to one <laughs> what kind of what did you do to the Hydra <laughs> build period that on top of the fact that some of the stats are just kind of strange I'm is that an actual attack I I'm looking at you resistance strange I'm I I'm looking at you resistance uh-uh, uh-uh. Resistance is infinitely better than adaptability. Oh, boy. But no, DS3 has a lot better equipment. But yeah, no, seriously, like, more so, you know, committing to one kind of build, it funnels you, and you actually really have to commit to one particular weapon. And, and that's be because there's only one Titanite slab in the whole fucking game. Because the resources for upgrading gear are incredibly scarce, which is fine in and of itself, but it means that experimentation becomes quite expensive on how powerful you could theoretically be if you just committed to one weapon. And to make matters worse, the really arbitrary and obtuse nature of the, you know, upgrading menus themselves and the clunkier UI don't help at all. They are so obtuse when it, com when it comes to explaining how stuff works, whether you're upgrading or repairing weapons or armor or how to upgrade something further if you have the materials for it and so on isn't always obvious. There's a ton of quality of life improvements that Dark Souls would eventually receive, but DS1 would unfortunately not quite benefit from them. For example, you guys know that Firelink Shrine just in general is like your central hub. You're going to be visiting there a lot and it's pretty like integral, I would say, to the overall structure of, you know, interacting with the game and getting around and stuff like oh, that. Oh, bro, your Firekeeper is dead? That never happens to me because I always kill Lautric that but your firelink shrine in ds1 can be permanently inactive if you accidentally use the firekeeper soul to reinforce your estus instead of returning it to her this is a very common mistake to make that permanently makes your game more inconvenient or just don't or just kill lautrec at the start and not worry about it yeah or the fact that humanity is required to fully kindle the flames. I don't even hate this idea. It's just that, like, the mechanic itself takes so long and can feel incredibly time-wasty and clunky and just tedious. Well, there's a reason why they never brought humanity, the humanity mechanic back ever again. And it's just because it wasn't that good <laughs> to do and a lot of this could be really tightened up rolling over 25 percent is so bad feeling i mean you can only roll in four directions period uh it's got a very terribly paced late game armor and weapon durability annoyances and could only roll in four directions terrible slow roll after over 25 percent rate weight broken black knight weapons spells and poise Terrible PvP, garbage unfinished late game, still there goes the best, still, there goes the best damn gar Dark Souls we ever had. Ugh. True. <laughs> That's fucking true.
and so on. This part of the game is undeniably in need of some polish, which thankfully FromSoft would eventually straighten out. But Dark Souls 1 is exceptionally unfinished. Uh, I believe the reason why is because Bandai forced them, it, it, it made, they made them uh, force the rest of it out. Um, thankfully, it, they, they cobbled together enough to make the game enough money to make the DLC. And that's good. But Dark Souls 1 is incredibly unfinished. I believe there are mods that make the the full version of Dark Souls 1 feel way better. But the point is, as much as I love Dark Souls 1, it does have some clear holes and shortcomings when it comes to its level design, uh, combat progression, and just overall game choices. Like, can we all agree on the fact that Dark Souls 1 has some downright obnoxious level bits as well? I'm totally for Dark Souls and its oppressive environments. It's part of what makes it challenging and fun. But there's a really fine line between a good challenge and being downright unfair and tedious the beams in an orlando as well as the silver archers there the tomb of the giants and that stupid ass layout with no easy way to backtrack and so on in my opinion it does go too far in a few places where it just feels cruel without the proper proportionate reward to match it but only on occasion and it certainly doesn't represent the broader game design for the most part in the first half of the game approximately in ds1 you are not able to warp or fast travel to bonfire and even when you can, not every bonfire can be teleported to. This works in the early game because it does encourage you to revisit the interconnected areas that now you've opened up the map and it gives you a chance to, you know, tangibly see how much more powerful you've gotten. However, it can also be just downright tedious to get back to some areas or bosses since you can't teleport to the closest bonfire directly. The No, that is saved for the entire other half of the game. Also, I reminded myself that I needed to download Daughters of Ash for a remastered. Outings to bosses can be pretty scuffed, honestly. I think FromSoft eventually realized that they want to minimize the time that players spend mindlessly running back and forth to a spot to engage the bosses, and, and more so to spend the time, you know, actually engaging with the con- I've never touched that bonfire that's right there. Content, which is why routes to bosses have become shorter and shorter. I think DS1 really struggles here. I think some of the boss routes are truly the definition of time. The bed of chaos route to the boss, to uh, it is the most obnoxious pain in the ass in the world. It is by far the worst. Wasting tedious and just being besides a chore. maybe Artorias. I mean, like, like actually, what the. F is going on here the run back time on a few of these fights is more time than the actual fight itself takes a lot of the time it's insane and that's the case for many of the boss encounters in ds1 this also plays into one of the biggest strengths and weaknesses of dark souls and that is how widely an experience with a certain section or boss can vary from player to player or even playthrough to playthrough because dark souls 1 is a non-linear linear game you can technically choose to do almost any area you want in any order however depending on how you tackle it personally it will make it so that you may have a very much easier or harder time depending on which routes and order you took because it's so open-ended you might actually over or under prepare and level for a boss where you know someone may have did that did that one first or last uh save pinwheel until you have to do him don't do the catacombs until you have to uh, you will have a much better experience with just 10 flasks than if you have 20. It's so smart the way everything's woven and connected, but it doesn't allow for a really tuned experience that some other FromSoft games capture. Dark Souls 3, for example, isn't exactly linear, but it's way more linear than DS1. And you can criticize Dark Souls 3 for being a, li a little bit more linear, but it has the added benefit of it makes it easier to curate how powerful a player should or should not be by the time they get to said boss. This is a problem with Elden Ring which I'm sure will be covered when we watch that video. <laughs>
effect. It just lacks some fine tuning and consistency in DS1, which again is a strength and a weakness. This is a bit of an issue in the first half of the game and downright crumbles in the late game. Yeah. But still, as a whole, I would say the masterpiece that is the first half of Dark Souls 1, in concert with its beautiful set pieces and obstacles, far make up for the shortcomings it most certainly does have. Now, the next thing I do want to touch on is combat. I mean, to put it delicately, Dark Souls 1 combat is certainly much more basic, vanilla, rigid, and a little bit slow than we're probably accustomed to at this point. Once again, that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad at all. In fact, it's still really solid at its core. It's just clearly lacking in things that make Dark Souls combat feel so damn good. Like, it's not as sexy or flashy or quick as some of oh, the Lord. newer games, and there's really no interesting offensive combo inputs. You've just got your basic light, heavy attack and kick, plus like whatever spells or magic you want to use. You can only roll in four directions, period, and bosses themselves have a very limited moveset, and the combat pace is far slower than in more modern games. It sounds funny to say, but Dark Souls 1 is really almost like a turn-based combat system. Not literally, but it, it's, it's really clearly like attack or wait for enemy to attack and then respond and or whiff punish. Rinse and repeat. That's like the entire combat loop, which, you know, all Dark Souls combat more or less is like that at its core, but DS1 more than any other has that slow pace to its combat where it's the most apparent and obvious. There's like a very hard line between your turn and then the enemy turn. It's like there's a bunch of things that you can tell are, are very clearly like quality of life changes that would just make the combat fluid and, and more responsive. Like, like it just feels incredibly clunky when not being able to move at all when using Estus or being stuck in any other slow ass animation. I can't fault its combat too much though because the core fundamentals are still intact it's just a much slower you know bait out moves and whiff punish play style than I personally prefer on the bright side there are a few bosses who make this game's combat really shine but some do not gel well with what it's going for too well either but despite having you know more dated stiff basic and rigid feeling combat it's still a super fun system to engage with and it, it makes bosses and regular enemies encounter is really fun to chew through and through the game's variety of areas also if you're someone who gravitates yo yo shout out to river rock oh bro i i have to show this comment river rock i'm sorry yo i gotta show this it's just easier to stand in the lava it's not that big of a deal <laughs> savage fuck yeah dude That's sick. Yeah, thanks, man. Towards using magic-based builds, the blue mana bar from Demon Souls is gone and wouldn't reappear until Dark Souls 3. Mm -hmm. So now you have to work with a... Which is something that confused me. They had the FP system figured out from the very beginning from Demon Souls and didn't implement it again until Dark Souls 3. <laughs> Imagine how different the games would have been if they had included the FP bar. It's a hard set number of spells, no questions asked. It's not my favorite iteration of Souls combat systems, but like I said, its bones and DNA are all still there, but that's really all it is at the end of the day at this point is kind of just bones. The entire area of Firelink Shrine and its design here is also quite special, and it feels like Firelink Shrine was made for Dark Souls 1 specifically. I know that sounds kind of weird and obvious, but I guess just like the central hub world in other Dark Souls games just isn't quite as well like dialed in as I think DS1 is when it comes to secrets that you can discover you know just underneath the surface so to speak or the NPC quest lines this is why the interconnected design works as well as it does you'll inevitably re be revisiting a lot of these areas multiple times over giving you huge opportunities to do tasks for all these NPCs or run into them where in a more forward moving linear game you may just forget entirely or never really have the opportunity to go back there and complete it. 
even though it's laid out well and bonfire placements are really meticulous it isn't exactly seamless and not to mention the dlc because it can't really be baked into the core world at all it ends up playing much more like a dark souls 3 linear style of level layout which isn't a the dlc for dark souls 1 is essentially foreshadowing of where they wanted to go bad thing exactly it just doesn't really feel like it's connected to the rest of dark souls 1 all that much this means firelink is a central hub that you'll inevitably be seeing a lot but all of its functions can't be utilized until quite late in the game but all things considered i really do enjoy how nicely it is integrated with the larger world now of course we know dark souls originally came out over a decade ago and it's been oh god i'm so old remastered in 2018 and between these two games the visuals and aesthetics and set pieces world design and music sounds etc are really one in the same but while ds1 doesn't really have the widest variety of visuals and level layouts the ones it does have are pretty damn good when it comes to stuff like atmosphere and tone specifically in fact what's sort of interesting is that when it comes to audio and like other music i mean if you've played it you'll know that dark souls 1 is fairly silent You've got some music here and there, and like especially when you're walking through Firelink, for example, that really stands out amongst the rest of the world, and it really makes it feel like a safe haven because many of the other areas just don't have anything going on. But otherwise, it's just ambience and you and the world and your thoughts, which was probably both a deliberate design choice as well as a budgetary benefit. While every game, you know, forward would feature a lot more music tracks and just overall sound design, DS1 remains eerily quiet for a majority of the game and only uses music when it really counts, like in boss encounters. Just the simple act of not using music isn't necessarily a positive. Like, on occasion, I think the silence is the most piercing thing in Dark Souls. It's incredible and it really adds some tension and atmosphere to the game. I think the silence is the most unnerving part whenever you're in areas like Blight Town, um, the Duke's Archives, some of the worst, some of the hardest areas in the game where you know that if you die, you have to go all the way back. But other times, I think it just makes the game feel unfinished, especially in the late game in some particular areas that shouldn't be so quiet. I think it makes the game feel very, like, unpolished, and this clearly isn't done. Really, the only alternative to this is to have a constant looping background music that is just, you know, so incredibly standard nowadays. And it, it's just a personal preference thing. And while, again, I can really appreciate the silence at points, it does also make the game feel unfinished in a lot of ways, too especially when you consider the more sloppy and unpolished late game experience, but it doesn't hurt the overall game too much at all. I don't dock that many points from it. The color palette is not my favorite thing either. I mean, the remaster is pretty faithful to the original game when it comes to like color tones and art direction and just the look of the game, but the more drab and dreary colorless environments aren't really my cup of tea personally. I think the mods that give the color palette much more color <laughs> are a lot better i gave big praise to ds3 for having the drab gray and brown environments but also being heavily contrasted with the orange glowing embers or the beautiful sky boxes etc the use of color is tasteful and adds some visual spice to an otherwise somewhat bland looking game and i feel that dark souls 1 just doesn't quite have that but even with that in mind, I do still feel like it has a solid identity and look that makes it special in its own ways despite all of its technical limitations. I think beyond all of these really smart and intelligent, just good game design choices, uh, one of the things that makes Dark Souls so incredibly special, the from soft magic that people talk about all the time, is the fact that they seemingly give you very little to work with, and then you cross that fog wall, and then they're like, okay, kill God. But the heart of Dark Souls has... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's essentially every Souls game ever. Uh, these are your controls. These are your weapons. Now go kill God. Always been about overcoming <laughs> extreme obstacles. And that's basically the summary of every Souls game ever. Is uh, you start from nothing. Hey, go kill God and become God is essentially the story of every FromSoft game at its basics.
and challenges even when it feels like in, it's impossible without being given any guidance or help from the game. It's all you and your actions that determine whether you succeed or fail in the matter. The game beats you down but also boosts your confidence and celebrates your victories when you are successful in achieving something great, which is why the bosses in this game have become so iconic. Once again, not the strongest lineup of bosses we've ever seen, and some are quite unremarkable or bland, but I think it's worth discussing some of the standout ones in detail, so let's get into bosses and their impact on the experience of Dark Souls 1. The thing about Dark Souls 1 bosses, whether it's for just because of how dated the game is, or because this is genuinely what happened as a result of their dev cycle being a little bit rushed, a lot of these bosses end, end up being really interesting concepts rather than something that feels like it's a fully finished and fleshed out dialed in product, and it's kind of a big problem. A lot of the early game bosses don't suffer from this too much, but the late game bosses certainly do. Now, when it comes to DLC, these bosses are... I, I think undeniably some of the best in the game. But I can't lie, Dark Souls 1 has some pretty dramatic ups and downs when it comes to boss quality and such, and even a lot of the bosses that get copy-pasted, there is a lot of that going on here. Let's oh, just yeah. say that. <laughs> But to begin, however, the first boss that you are going to fight in the tutorial area is the Asylum Demon, and I think this is a completely fine tutorial boss, because it shows you that you're not all powerful in this game. You're going to come in with the broken sword hilt and deal next to no damage, until you realize that again- No, you no, you're doing two damage every swing. That's, that's damage. Two hand that bitch and fucking kill it. Don't- don't be a pussy. <laughs> need to escape through the door. Once you actually get a real weapon and initiate a plunging attack, you get massive damage, and then this fight becomes, you know, a lot more palatable to what you would expect a boss fight to be. It's not quite as satisfying, I think, as it could be when defeating this thing, and its moveset isn't the the like the most varied thing ever. There are other versions of this demon that do have a fully fleshed out moveset, but this one is pretty basic. It's by no means my favorite example of a tutorial boss for the introduction, but I think it being a capstone to how smart the rest of the tutorial area is, it gets away with being, you know, slightly more vanilla and basic and bland when it comes to its actual encounter, but it's fine for what it is, and you'll see variants of it later on. Now, as mentioned earlier, because of the non-linear linear design, you may encounter bosses in a slightly different order, but for the most part in the early game, a player is either going to encounter the Capra Demon or the Taurus Demon next, most likely the Taurus Demon. Again, this has the same uh, idea, I suppose, as the plunging attack for the Asylum Demon that it teaches you, but if you choose to not engage with that mechanic, then you're on this, like, really skinny design of... You can get the Taurus Demon to fall off this... this... Uh, broken ledge here if you get him to do his uh, backwards jump off of it. But the problem is you have to bait that. Of an area that makes the camera feel incredibly jank and with how big this enemy is, it just feels a little sloppy. Uh, of course, you're clearly supposed to do the plunging attack, but even if you don't, it's still completely doable. It just doesn't feel as quite, you know, finely crafted as... It's also the same story with the Capra Demon. You can kill all three of the of the early game demon bosses with plunging attacks. Literally, the first thing they teach you is to do the plunging attack on the tutorial boss, and you can do that for the next three bosses. Hello? <laughs> it's, it's genius. As the encounter with the, uh, uh, the Asylum Demon did. However, after the Taurus Demon, you'll probably fight the Capra Demon. Also, why, why is he naked? I'm gonna get demonetized. I'm kidding, I'm not monetized to begin with. Which again, kind of same idea, but not really. It's an incredibly small space with other dogs in it that are insanely annoying. You can sort of drop down from this, but also not really. And not to mention, the route to get to this fight is an absolute nightmare, and I just don't really think this one was quite as thought through as well as maybe they expected. It's one of my least favorite fights in the game, period. And on top of that, they reuse the Capra Demon as a normal enemy pretty late in the game, so it just makes this feel encounter feel incredibly chore-like, and I'm not a big fan of the arena, the design, or the Taurus Demon, you know, in the previous encounter. Neither of these fights really do it for me. I think the first fight that I really enjoyed in Dark Souls 1 ah, is the Bell Gargoyles. The Bell Gargoyles. The first of many gank fights. Oh boy. No, Bell Gargoyles is very well designed. I enjoy Bell Gargoyles. 
bell gargoyles a lot. Gargoyles, and which is strange because on paper, I feel like this is a fight that's so easy to get wrong. This, the, like, uh, in theory, it's a fight that I would absolutely hate. You know, you've got a flying enemy, you have two enemies going on at once, you've got, you know, more than one thing to deal with, and some of its moves can feel, you know, a little wonky at times. But the execution of this fight is really where the sauce is. This is where the magic happens. It's nice because even though their moves are pretty strong and they're not necessarily slow, they aren't the most aggressive enemy in the game either, and they have have a lot of animations that will you know lock them into place for a long period of time giving you plenty of opportunity to fight the other one maybe you know do some tail cutting to get weapons and also telling you that hey tail cutting is, is a mechanic in the game that can grant you weapons and such but I think this fight is really yeah on like six enemies in the whole game uh, there's the bell gargoyles there's the the Drake and undead Berg there's the uh, the one dragon in Ash Lake. There's Calamit, uh, the guardi the the sanctuary guardian. There's one I'm forgetting, uh, gaping dragon, and Seath. So seven straightforward and pretty excellent my only minor gripe with this fight is i wish the surface area of the roof was slightly larger to allow you to maneuver a bit more and have a bit more creative play no because then it would be dark souls 2 If you're baiting out attacks and stuff it just gets a little cluttered up here and sometimes prevents you from you know getting around an enemy even if you get like a really hard read you just can't do much about it so i think the environment is actually the only thing holding it back next boss i really want to talk about is moonlight butterfly which oh, is boy. the prime example this is like a case study of a boss that is a pure concept without really being a final thing moonlight butterfly has an interesting idea where you know it sort of flies around this really skinny arena and you can only deal damage to it with with slight vulnerability windows when it lands to do a thing uh, unless you're using a magic build or if you're throwing stuff at it you can deal damage as it's fl I've never seen that attack before flying around but it also has a very very limited move set and it's just this like slow paced fight where you're just waiting around most of the time there's no actual you know real active engagement with the boss besides the occasional dodge here and there and then going up to damage it when it becomes vulnerable there's no way to trigger its vulnerability either you kind of just have to pray and wait not the biggest fan at all of Moonlight Butterfly. It is optional, so I can't really complain too much, but it, again, it just doesn't feel like this was thought through all that well. It maybe shouldn't even be in the game because it just doesn't, it, like, it feels like you're playing a beta build of a boss or just like a, 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 you know, a version one. It's just not really that fun, in my opinion. Up next is the most sad fight in the game, who is everyone's favorite pup, the best, the bestest dog. <laughs> if he's just trying to protect their <laughs> Thank you. I needed that. Uh yeah, Sif Sif is the best uh is the best version of this fight that they've ever done. They've tried to do a version of Sif in almost every FromSoft game. Uh Grave Tender Great Wolf, uh Red Wolf of Radagon, you know your master's grave and it also becomes really sad when you get this boss pretty low health and it starts stumbling all over the place and stuff it's 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 a fight you don't even want to finish but as far as its mechanics go it's not the most interesting thing in the game it's pretty easy i would say but it's just like kind of one-dimensional mechanically pretty straightforward and there isn't really much to break down with this one but it's okay because the dog is safe in the little magic ring in the thing so we're good now as if blight town wasn't <laughs> insane enough and running across this entire poison lake Lake wasn't you know brutal uh, too much uh, then you are faced with the capstone which is chaos witch quaylog and I would say for me it's not my favorite fight in the game but it's pretty damn high tier still and if you're down bad as hell it'll probably be top tier for you but I really enjoy about this fight is a few things it has those yes because nobody likes anything better than an ugly ass spider with the top half with some 
very tasteful titties. Properties of like a more area of effect attack kind of slower paced creature like the bottom half of the actual like spider. But then you have hmm. the more fast paced moment to moment kind of action with the witch herself and her sword. The it, Also, the arena that you're in really does complement the moveset as well because it, you have a lot of square footage to work with. And part of its attack with the actual spider is that it can, you know, lay these lava pits around the ground and kind of deny some of the area. So you need a lot of space to work with for this fight to be fair and fun. And thankfully, it really does manage that. But what I appreciate most about this fight is that all of its moves, yes, they are brutal and pretty insane, but they're all hella reactable and have these telegraph signs that something is coming. Also, fun fact, if you are uh, up on the spider's uh, face all the time, uh, Quaylag can't hit you uh, with her sword. She, she can't hit you. So, for example, when the spider actually does spew lava, she, like, taps on its head to initiate that. When she's about to do her stab move with the sword, you can see it wind up very clearly and, you know, start cooking. I think this is a really solid fight that isn't just a concept. It feels like a fully fleshed out idea, and it's a, you know, hybrid model that I think, you know, FromSoft really hasn't done too much to the same extent as this one did. I think this is probably the best example of, you know, a fight like this done well. But the thing that sucks... See, the thing I'm afraid of is that they're going to try and do that with Melania in the DLC because it's all but confirmed that the form that Melania takes when you fight her is only the second time that she's bloomed. And the, the thing that people have theory crafted is that when she does turn into the actual goddess of rot, she's going to get like a, a scorpion bottom. Like, her bottom half will become, like, a scorpion. And I think we'll get, like, Quaylag version 2. Which, don't get me wrong, that would be fucking sick. But I'm very afraid. <laughs> and is inexcusable is the fact that you pretty much have to take poison damage when coming into this and routing to the fight. Which mm -hmm. mm. Purple... Moss clumps. Stock up, people. <laughs> again, this is probably the weak... This is, this is, again, this is a point of... If you have the master key, you can get to dark root... Uh, you can get to, to, to dark root faster to go kill the little tree broccoli things to farm purple moss clumps weakest point of Dark Souls as it relates to bosses is the routes to get them are honestly bullshit a lot of the time. Either you take force damage or, you know, you have to eat poison or, or something like that and you need items to make sure that you're healed before you get into the thing. So, I'm not a huge fan of that, but this one is fine. Just the worst part of it is literally the route. The fight uh, itself, though, is excellent. The next boss I think worth discussing... I think that Blight Town is one of the most bullshit poison swamps that they've ever made ever. Yes, including Farron Keep. Yes, including the toxic, the 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 toxic swamp that that's in Profane Capital. Yes, including the Lake of Rot. Don't at me. It's true. Blight Town fucking sucks. Anyway, back to it is the gaping dragon and for as much as i love the introduction and setup of this fight i cannot honestly sit here and tell you that i enjoy this one this is one of my least favorite fights in the game even though i can admit fully that it's a objectively well-designed fight i just don't personally find this one enjoyable it's pretty slow paced and really the only things going on is that you know you want this one enjoy to admit the fully that it's do? a objectively well-designed fight i just don't personally find this one and get out things to punish them the tail can of course be broken in order to obtain an item and it also negates one of its most powerful moves and it, it takes different amounts of damage depending on where you hit it but honestly I, I don't know what is i just don't really have fun with this one i don't think it's a bad fight in any objective you know way shape or form it's just not really my cup of tea it's it is what it is it, it exists in the game i just don't really enjoy playing it if you're in the catacombs you're probably gonna eventually stumble across pinwheel and i'm not not exactly sure if this fight is supposed to be a meme or not and there is almost nothing to say about it exactly it seems like ridiculously easy and i don't it's because it was designed for you to be able to reach it at the very start of the game I don't really know if that was the point, but it, again, it's not really the highlight of this area themselves. If you do 
somehow make it through the Tomb of Giants and you come across Grave Lord Nido. This one is certainly better than Pinwheel, but I would say is a pretty mediocre fight in the game. Good idea in terms of having minions running around this area, and you can actually access this playable space through a, uh, a secret coffin earlier in the game. Mm -hmm. But Nido himself doesn't have as much going on as I would like to in order for this fight to be interesting. I don't know how like resilient the minions are in terms of how long it takes for them to get back up. I understand they have to be because Nito himself can kind of kill these off and maybe you can use that to your advantage and I understand their approach to this. I just don't think it really plays as well as maybe they hoped it would. I do want to give a bit of a shout out to the stray demon who then becomes later demon fire sage which I will not be talking about because these are a copy paste of one another which you know unfortunately is where Dark Souls 1 clearly shows its uh, lack of budget and or time and but this yeah. demon as far as its actual moveset is concerned is pretty fun. Again this is a more fleshed out version of the tutorial boss it's wielding the demon catalyst because it can which you know feels like it was curated for that part of the level just because it's the tutorial boss doesn't mean it's easy i would actually say it's on the slightly more difficult tier of bosses uh un until you figure it out it has very devastating moves but fairly reactable ones at that Next up, I think Iron Golem is one of the most disappointing bosses in the game, and I don't even know if its introduction, I would say, is all that exciting. So this boss can be... This is basically Tower Knight if Tower Knight sucked. Keep staggered and then knocked over, which, again, I'm not entirely sure... <laughs> wow. Talk about a failure of execution there. If they built this level so that it can be knocked over and just fall off the cliff so you immediately win, or if it's just so that you can deal a lot of damage, I don't know. This fight just doesn't seem to be as, you know, well articulated as maybe they thought it was. Some of it's They wanted to make another Tower Knight because Demon D Dark Souls 1 is a ripoff, is a, is a spinoff of Demon Souls moves are really jank and just aren't really fun to play against it's just not a very remarkable fight no matter which way you slice it if you end up taking a slight detour over to the secret painted world you'll probably eventually encounter crossbreed priscilla the the run up to priscilla from here to the very end the painted world of ariamis i'm not a huge fan just per personally i i, I the area isn't that cool. The boss isn't very good. I think this is one of the weakest of the bosses in the game. And I don't really have much to say about this fight other than this is like version one of what they would do with Sister Frida in Dark Souls 3. This boss is invisible at first, and you don't even have to fight her unless you engage first. She's quite easy to kill and not that aggressive. There just isn't a whole lot going on here, but it seems like this was the basic idea that would eventually become a really solid fight later in Dark Souls 3. Another optional boss is a fairly interesting idea. Once again, you know, you're in this like almost near infinite hallway it's not quite infinite but it feels like it a lot of the time and that's kind of how it's supposed to be but you chase Gwendolyn down to deal damage at different stages while just dodging it why aren't you using the pillars that's what they're there for Attacks. It's one of those things that, you know, you can't really do too fast no matter which way you slice it. You have to be pretty patient with this. It's just not, you know, particularly a engaging boss, and they haven't really, like, tried this idea very much in the future, which maybe for good reason. It just doesn't really work that well here, but I appreciate them experimenting with something like this. The track record of the mid-game bosses really sags in the middle until you get to what I would really classify as, like, the end of the mid-game bosses that sort of... This is the end of the first half of the game here in Anor Orlando, and it ends with easily the the second or third best boss in the entire game, which is Ornstein and Smo. And yes, I call them one boss, even though it's clearly a duo boss fight. This is the most perfect duo boss fight that they've ever done in the history of ever of leads into late game this is ornstein and smo and my god chat this is what it's all been about this is the fight that godskin duo wish they could be but they just ain't saucy like that also that's why in the convergence mod they replaced godskin duo with another copy paste of another enemy type 
this fight has basically two paths it can go. Depending on which one you kill first, the, the other will absorb the dead one's power. And so this can play differently depending on what you choose to do in this fight. It's got two alternate paths, so that's a lot of fun. There's maybe a few moves on either character that I don't love, but man, for the... Also, if you kill Smo first, the, it's basically uh, another version of the Nameless King fight. Except Ornstein just gets really big the most part this fight is absolutely immaculate i think the soundtrack is a slapper the atmosphere is great and mechanic unless you've been listening to it for two hours mechanically i would say this is the best base game boss the dlc of dark souls 1 has really solid bosses but when it comes to base game only i and again it's it's a duo fight which is really strange but i would still say ornstein and smo is probably the overall best fight in base game ds1 it is the best fight in base game DS1. Not only is Ornstein and Smo an amazing fight to beat just based on what it is, it's so incredibly satisfying. It is the absolute pinnacle. If you can beat Ornstein and Smo, you can beat the rest of the game. But you also, once upon completing it, get the access to get the Lord Vessel, meaning you can now teleport between bonfires. So the reward feels absolutely worth the effort required to get it, and it allows you to move forward with the late game of the rest of Dark Souls 1. While Ornstein and Smo are required to beat the game, uh, the Four Kings is probably where I would say the actual late game begins or unlocks. And this fight, I love getting there. I like the idea of just like dropping into the abyss and... This is the DPS check of the game. Not dying, and then you're just in this black void fighting these things. But the actual mechanics of the fight... Also, you're cheating, Chopper. You're using Havel's armor. ...go against everything that Dark Souls 1 has established. And it, it, I just don't really understand why they made this choice. It's basically a DPS race. You have to kill them, otherwise the kings can keep multiplying and eventually overwhelm you. You have to basically take them out one at a time and just tank their hits. It's, it's not really that enjoyable as far as... No, you don't have to tank their hits. You just have to stop getting hit. Manage your stamina better. What you've been learning to do this entire time, it doesn't feel like you've gotten better in a way that counts. And you know that you're meant to play this kind of way because their attacks deal significantly more damage if you're far away and trying to, like, you know, outright, outright dodge them. So basically what happened here is he failed the DPS check. Uh, mostly because the Claymore in this game sucks. Uh... The Zweihander is way better. Uh, if you can't kill the four kings without having any other ones spawn, you're not doing the fight correctly. Whereas if you're just like literally on top of them and in their face and just smacking them and tanking their hits, they can't really do a whole lot to you. I'm not even sure if you can dodge that attack. You And you just heal whenever you're starting to get low. It's not a great fight. Uh, it's interesting, but it's I can't even say it's that good. Next, I think Seat the Scaleless is probably the biggest missed opportunity as it relates to maybe being an interesting base game boss. I love the visuals of this. The things I hate are the route to get here. The run back is absolutely tedious as hell. And the fact that the arena itself does not feel like it fits this kind of boss. It consistently is clipping through the wall. Its hitboxes in terms of what is actually dangerous are really not clear whatsoever. But I love the way the, the boss looks aesthetically. That's because you're supposed to be fighting Seath from the front, not from the sides or behind him. If you want to get the Moonlight Greatsword, you have to get behind him, but that's the hardest part. It's just not really that remarkable otherwise, and I think it's just a, a giant missed opportunity to do a lot of cool things with its visuals and its mechanics. It's just not it, and again, not to mention, that run back route is horrendous. I said earlier in the video that I probably wasn't going to talk about every boss. I mostly just mean these ones, but now that I'm here, you know what? F*** it. Let's do this. Ceaseless Discharge is a meme. So Centipede Demon is an unfinished mess that is insanely unfun and looks like it came from a PS2 game. And Demon Fire Sage is a reskin of Stray Demon, but orange. There. And then finally, we get to possibly the worst fight in a Dark Souls game ever, or maybe one of the worst fights in video games, period. Bed of Chaos, I think I would rather eat glass than run this back more than a couple of times. <laughs> This is the most unfun way, like, I, I, I hardly even classify this as a boss. It's not even a boss. 
I don't even really think it is a boss fight, so to speak. This is a platform segment that you're going to have to painstakingly get through to hit the... Two See, here you go again. You're using Havel's armor when you need to be fast. Two sides of its thing while the floor falls out and hopefully you don't get sweeped in the thing. It's weird because this fight kind of like, I guess, you know, saves your progress, so to speak. Like if you break one of the sides... That was so You don't close. have to completely redo it uh, on don't subsequent do the fire runbacks. Spell. It's going to take you maybe a little while to get through. It's either a one and done, or it's going to take you a billion years. There's really no in-between. Oh, there it goes. And you hit a thing once to deal full damage to it, and then it's just dead. Again, I use the term boss very loosely. This is probably the most experimental fight, or one of the most experimental fights that FromSoft has ever done. That's not true. I can see this being an interesting concept if it was done a lot more like cleanly and fairly and it just wasn't as jank as this one is. I don't think I need to explain it more. If you've played it, you know how bad this can be. Unfortunately, Dark Souls 1 really stumbles over the finish line when it comes to its bosses and this one really weighs down the batting average. But finally, the last boss in the game, once you've beaten all these, is Gwyn, Gwyn. Lord of Cinder. And this one is okay. I would even say it's good, but it's not quite as like grand scale as you may expect from this which maybe is the point maybe that's fair but i i don't know i just felt incredibly underwhelmed by this fight thematically it makes sense as to why gwyn is not very strong but in terms of gameplay it's just awful and it's also hella cheesable if you're parrying but parrying in dark souls one is probably the easiest version of the parry system ever even if you're not, like, it's not that difficult to beat. Like, its moves are very, very basic and, and reactable. You'll probably beat it on your first try. I would just say it's a little underwhelming as a final boss. Not even bad, not even remotely bad. It's a high-tier fight in the game when ranking amongst the rest of the selection. But as far as what it could be, it's not something i i'm particularly in love with but the dlc bosses i think are a giant step up and are without a doubt the best bosses in the game you start with sanctuary guardian this is a good introduction because you have a lot of room to work with in this area it's a great like opener to the dlc itself it's not that hard of a boss and it's not super aggressive allowing you to get your bearings and kind of setting the tone for what the rest has to offer the bosses do get increasingly more difficult after this one but this is a good like confidence boost to let you know like hey you know i still got it i can take these on but they definitely crank up the difficulty and heat after you beat sanctuary guardian itself and the thing you're going to notice immediately when playing the DLC of Dark Souls 1, you know, unfortunately the level design, like I said, is disconnected from the rest of the world, but the bosses themselves, you can tell had way more time in the oven than all of the late game bosses in the base game. And after you beat Sanctuary Guardian, this takes you to, in my opinion, the best fight in the game, period. So true. Artorias is, abs is clearly the greatest boss in all of Dark Souls 1. Period. Knight Artorias, God, it's just so chef's kiss, my guy. When I was talking about earlier oh. how, you know, there's a few bosses in the game that really complement the combat pacing and style of Dark Souls 1, I think Nar Knight Artorias is the one that comes to mind most commonly. And this fight is absolutely immaculate. It's a, you know, very standard, just one-on-one, -on -one, no gimmicks. He has an interesting mechanic where he can power up if you allow him to. So if you choose to play more passive and, you know, take these moments and windows to heal yourself instead, you may let him get more power. The best way to fight Artorius is no healing, all in, no breaks, all gas, no breaks kind of boss. Like, you have to fight him, one health bar, that's what you get powerful and risk dealing with higher punishment if, if you don't stop him if you do stop him you risk you know missing these healing windows yourself or to do other actions so this fight is all about deciding in the moment what's best for you and your particular run this fight is absolutely just pure sauce and i know i say it all the time but a fight like this i honestly wouldn't mind if that was like every fight in the game i know it, you know dark if Dark Souls 1 had this fight in every fight in the game, it literally would have been the perfect video game. Would get repetitive if every fight you know played similarly to this, but I really wouldn't complain. I love Knight Artorias so much, it is by far the highlight of the DLC for me, and is one of the most iconic fights in all of Dark Souls the entire series. This this boss, there's a reason why Artorias made it onto the cover. For, for Dark Souls 1. It's because he's 
easily the best boss in the game. But it also cemented the fact that Dark Souls and Miyazaki himself takes a lot of inspiration from Berserk. Like, this is one of the most Berserk bosses in all of Dark Souls. Again, you'll really feel that rhythm that gets established in Knight Artorius' fight. And I know they reused a lot of this, like, framework and fights that have been similar to Knight Artorius in the future. And that I also think do really well. This is just a working formula that... Don't fix what's not broken. Really, no matter the implementation, I'm always going to enjoy and is always going to be an excellent fight. It is one of the more... It sucks, though, that this evolved into Malekith. Because Malekith, this is what... Nar Artorius is the framework that Malekith was built upon. Because they have the same aesthetic. They have the same... Uh, sort of ideas behind them and that's kind of the point but the problem is that Malaketh is such a short boss fight and that his moveset is not as nearly intuitive as Artorius is difficult ones in the game but I think it that's completely fine because it's just so immaculately executed that I cannot help but absolutely adore it when it does come up and then after that you have Manus father of the abyss what can I say about Manus? He's the GOAT. I mean, it's it's a brutal, fast-paced, you know, devastating... Manus is a Bloodborne boss in Dark Souls 1. That's all I have to say. ...fight that uh, I... He's literally the Cleric Beast. With some extra spice. So technically, he's Lawrence. <laughs> I honestly is just as saucy as Knight Artorius. It's a little bit less of that emphasis on one on one kind of moment to moment gameplay, but I think it does just fine in terms of like rewarding you for playing smart. Until he starts juggling you. Understanding its threat range and good timing. Manus isn't even my favorite fight in the DLC, but still it dumps all over He's my second favorite fight. He's he's my third favorite fight in the game. Uh because it goes Artorius, Ornstein and Smo, Manus. And then Calamite. Those are my favorite bosses. I am so stupid. I pressed my numpad. And if you didn't know that, if you are on PC using YouTube and you're clicked into the video window, if you use your numpad, it actually takes you to different parts Manus, of the video. They are both immaculate. I have good and you range and good timing. Manus isn't even my favorite fight in the DLC, but still, it dumps all over anything in base game Dark Souls 1, maybe besides Ornstein and Smo. It's so good, and you can tell they probably had a lot of time to really refine and perfect these fights, and I think these two are really the standouts. In terms of atmosphere and mechanics, they are both immaculate. I have a hard time deciding whether I really like Artorius better or Manus. I mean, they're very close to me. I think I would still have to go Artorius, but... This one is still super excellent. The final fight in the DLC is the Dragon Calamite. And I know some people take issue with this fight. And again, dragons aren't really my favorite kind of fight. I greatly prefer something like Artorias. But I can completely appreciate the, the understanding and experimentation of how Calamite operates in Dark Souls 1. I think it's a great blueprint fight for dragons that they've clearly iterated on in future titles. I'm not about to sit back and tell you. Calamite turned into Medir which Medir turned into every dragon fight in Elden Ring. <laughs> uh, especially, uh, which Medir evolved into Placidusax, which I feel is kind of lost potential, but it's whatever. This fight is perfect, but as far as what it does accomplish, you know, it's got a fair amount of... You literally walked right into that. What are you doing? You know, area of effect attacks, it's got some, you know, respondable and reactable swinging moves. This fight definitely feels good to get better at, and I think that is, like, part of the magic that makes a good Dark Souls boss. A lot of them who don't feel better to get good at end up being pretty low tier. But Calamite, you can actually feel yourself improving as you play. And not to mention, this goes for all of the DLC bosses. The routes to get to them, all of the runback routes, are, like, really solid. I, I Nothing is particularly annoying or, you know, out of the way or tedious. Everything is the only one I don't like is Manus fairly straightforward and getting to Calamite isn't really that hard and it's exciting to run it back and learn
As a whole package, the DLC, every single boss, again, takes a fat dump on anything in the base game. Basically, again, besides maybe Ornstein and Smo and a few little gems here and there. But most of the base game bosses are a little inconsistent, if not sometimes outright terrible. The bosses, however, are still an integral part of what makes Dark Souls so damn good, and as an entire experience with the DLC included, you have a very good selection of bosses that are going to give you a nice challenge and a good gameplay variety that, that complements the combat system that Dark Souls does really well. Dark Souls is a game that works because it operates on so many different levels, from being just genuinely a great game in an objectively well-designed video game at that, it works psychologically on that risk-to-reward pathway that really other games aren't able to achieve the same way, and it can be played in almost an infinite number of ways for an infinite amount of challenges, and it's one of the most gracefully aged games ever made. Dark Souls was made initially just as a spin-off of Demon Souls, but this ended up being their working formula, and here is where they caught lightning in a bottle. Yep. It's where they caught fire. Oh, that's literally what I was talking about with uh, Melania, is this. I, I think people are thinking that this is what Melania is going to turn into. And I could see it, but I don't know if I want to see it. <laughs> No, we're not watching that this time. 